Good morning, everyone. I see there's about uh, maybe half the class is here. Maybe it's just good for a short one. Now, while waiting, are there any questions from the previous lecture on the fuzzy Baltic systems? I think uh, maybe a uh, quick alert now. Oh, for the E and E students, the department has uh, decided that the your oral presentation will be on week twelve. So please uh, discuss with your supervisor uh, what is the best time for you to have that. Uh, oral presentation. Furthermore, you're only given 20 minutes to present and with another 10 minutes for the QA. So each of each student will be given half an hour, 30 minutes to, for that oral presentation. So you need to be focused on what, what to say and what to show during that oral presentation. I think Dr. Ko Kaming will send out the Notification, I think very soon. It's actually asking the supervisors and the uh, examiner what's a good time for the uh, to, to fit the uh, for the schedule. Okay, I think we have up uh, maybe something like seventy percent of the students uh, this morning. So welcome to this uh, new topic on fuzzy access systems, which is an extension uh, continuation of the topic on fuzzy logic. So in the previous week, we talked about the fuzzy logic. Now we're going to use some of those concepts in the fuzzy expert systems. As you can see here, there are certain, you will see that there are certain similarities. If you what you have studied so far for the past couple of weeks, right on the rule-based expert systems, and then you have your uncertainty management. All these actually are related in the sense that uh, the those earlier ones are actually based on either the certain factors or the grip set, right? But still based on rules. So we can see that we're actually using rules to capture the expertise of the experts into that artificial system. So what do we hope to learn? Uh, after the uh, end of this particular topic. We will first of all talk about the Mandani fuzzy inference uh, system. Now for those of you actually have uh, started your lab on module number three, which is on fuzzy expert system or fuzzy inference system, whereby we try to build a, a fuzzy inference system for tipping. How much tips should I give to the waiter or waitress? And then uh, we also want to we will spend some time to look at your Sugeno type of fuzzy inference systems. What's the difference? What are the issues that the uh, Sugeno fuzzy inference system addresses that uh, Mandani has failed to provide? So also we do a comparison between your Mandani and your Sugeno fuzzy inference system. If you look at, uh, I think look at two case studies, uh, whereby we see how we can build, how the, these two examples have been built using this uh, fuzzy access system. And at the end, we will summarize what we have uh, talked about in the lecture itself. So let's look at the fuzzy inference. So the most commonly used fuzzy inference technique is the so-called Mandani method, right? In fuzzy logic, they always say that uh, if you study fuzzy logic, at some point in your studies, you will come across the name of Professor Lofty Sade. The same goes for your fuzzy inference technique. And you will come across this term called Mandani method. What does it mean, right? So in 1975, Professor Ibrahim Mandani of the London University built one of the first 
fuzzy system to control a steam engine and a boiler combination. So his system, basically his fuzzy system, basically controls the steam engine and a boiler. As you know, the steam engine actually is based on the concept of a boiling water, where the steam is created and then it pushes, actually creates an engine, uh, creates power, uh, that's the power of that. The unique thing is that, the new thing is that he actually applied a sort of fuzzy rules. He did not use the Bayesian, neither did he use uh, certain factors. But he built it on using fuzzy rules, which was supplied by the experienced human operators. Again, without sounding too boring, right? Again, you can see that all the time they talk of when they build such expert systems, the actual knowledge, right? In, in this case, the knowledge in the in the in terms of the fuzzy rules were supplied by experienced uh, human operators and experts. So we always rely back on the experts because human experts. Because why? We wanted to uh, extract his or her knowledge into and build it in the replica in the system that is similar to the expert. Therefore, we call it that's why we call it expert systems. Now, what does the Mandani fuzzy inference system consist of? Right? The Mandani fuzzy uh, inference process or technique is performed in four steps. What are these four steps? The four steps are shown below here. The first step is the classification of the input variables. The input variables, whatever they are, must be appropriately classified. Then after that process or that first step, then you will then look at the rules, evaluate the rules. So the Rule evaluation basically uh, look at the which of the rules for fire, and then when they fire, what is the strength of their firing? So, unlike the Cook's method, whereby if you, we always assume that when we fire, it fires good. No, not in this case. In the fuzzy inference system, we will look at the strength of your firing. Now, once the rule fire, and uh, in the practical real world case. There will not be one rule, neither will it be two rules. In a really useful fuzzy system, there will be many rules. So how do you combine? How do you aggregate the outputs from the rules? Right? So we need to have a process, a step, a technique to aggregate or combine the rule outputs. Now once you do that, then I want to also defalsify the rule outputs. So it's a reverse now. Instead of falsification as shown here, now we're trying to defalsify. When we defalsify, I will then create, I will then compute, I will then calculate, I will then give you just one value. So going back to our example in the lab, which some of you will be doing in the following week, will be how much tip do I give? Right? It's no good to say that I should give a, a small tip, I should give an average tip, I should give a large tip. I want to know exactly how much I give. So based on the fuzzy system, this will be the falsified to give you one actual value. It should be 5% of your total bill. It should be 10% of the total bill. It should be 30 percent of the total bill. So we give you a, a number, a unique number. That's the answer that you're trying to get. It will not be fuzzy. It will be uh, absolute value. So let's look at the example of a simple, again, two inputs, one output problem that now has three rules. So we have two sets of examples here. We consisting of three rules. Actually, it's a, I would say it's the same, right? I'll explain why. On the left hand side here, this column here, rule number one, if x is true, no, if x is a true, this x is a sign of value of a true, 
A A three, yeah. Or Y is B one, then Z is C one. If or rule number two, if X is A two, no, and Y now is uh, B two. Now instead of using all, I'm using the N function now. Then Z would be C two. Finally, if uh, or rule three, if X is A one, then my Z should be C three. Now, why do I say it's only one? Simple example because actually on this left hand side here, we are actually looking at very uh, what do you call it, uh, um, variables, right? X is a three, so maybe difficult to understand, to appreciate. Now, if you would replace my x and my a three and my a two and my a ones, now this is more on concept and conceptual. Now, here is actually a real sort of real jumping. Closer to real world. So if I replace my X as a project funding and my A3 as adequate, A2 as marginal, A1 as inadequate, not enough. You see that this system now, these same three rules uh, can be applied or is applied to uh, project management system, the uh, risk uh, assessment. To assess the risk of my project either failing or being successful based on two inputs. The two inputs are how much money, how much budget do you have for the project? How much people do you have for your project? So if this is replaced now, <coughs> on the same three rules, we say that uh, if your project funding is adequate, the budget is adequate. Or your project staff is small, then your risk of your project failing is low. For rule two, if your project funding is marginal now, and so you can see here, what we're trying to do is actually to cover all our bases, cover all the various aspects of your project funding. It's marginal now. And your project staffing is large. You have a large team of people which actually you would like to have. Right? So you have project, your funding is sufficient to pay for your staff, to pay for your uh, expenses, to pay for your uh, equipment and your travel, for example. Then the risk is normal. Right? Normal means normal. So it means normal. It's not low. It's actually normal. It means that there's a, still a chance for you to fail in your project. Finally, rule number three. Now, if your project funding is not, is not enough, is inadequate, then the risk is high of your project failing. And all this, as I said before, is not created out of, from, from thin air. We have, it's actually normally created from uh, lots of uh, hard work to talking, in talking to the expert. From there, you extract these rules. <clears throat> so these are the example. It's an example of the what two inputs, one output problem that can be uh, solved with a fuzzy inference system. In this case, it will be uh, evaluation, evaluation of the risk of your project. So as I said, first step, we will have to falsify our inputs, right? So if you assign your Um, this inputs x1, x2, oh, sorry, x1 and y1 to project funding and project staffing. Right? So, of course, this will be some uh, basically on the universe of this cost of x1 and universe of this cost of y1 within a certain range that you that is appropriate for that input. Right? So, again, for example, project funding will be in terms of, uh, say, in, in, our, in, in our case, we will get. Maybe, uh, so say 1 million will be the maximum, for example, right? Looking at that range. What range should it be? Uh, what, what, what's the appropriate range for you to measure that uh, input? Then, what is the, uh, for the project staffing, maybe for your, depend on your company, right? Maybe 100 or 200 may be a good number for you to measure, right? 
of what is large, what is small. Of course, we cannot say uh, small or large. Things on this, uh, large or small, right? So the same for every company. So each company will be different because for, for the small company, large is actually uh, maybe in terms of hundreds. For the large company, large is actually in terms of a few thousand, right? Because you cannot compare apple to oranges, right? So Intel against like a small player, right? Or something like that. And then after you actually, uh, then you uh, assign the names uh, to your project, to your inputs, which is the uh, Chris inputs, X1, Y1. Then you determine the degree to which this input belong to each of the appropriate fuzzy sets, or basically your memberships, uh, the fuzzy sets. So in this case, what we have, we have uh, for project funding, we have adequate, uh, sufficient, Chuko, uh, marginal, Politahan, and the last one is inadequate, but Chuko, right? Now, project staffing, we have small, large, or high. Project, uh, small and large, only two, two uh, sets, which is either small or large. It's shown here. So here, uh, for the first one is project funding. Project funding will be adequate, marginal, inadequate. So all of them, this will be A3, A2, and A1. So A3, A2, A1. Notice here also, we have a certain amount of overlap between each of these sets, hundred sets. Right, so this is again to highlight to you that uh, if you have any value here within that unit of this cost X or X1, some value X1, which is your funding, say 100,000, right? Uh, ringgit. What's the membership for A1? A1 will be an adequate A2 is marginal, right? So A1, A2, what's the, what's the uh, membership? So you can see here, membership for uh, A1 is actually. 0.5, right? And I think the uh, last, the uh, second one, A2, a membership is 0.2. So membership for A2 based on X1 is only 0.2. Now over here on the right hand side, we have the same thing, but this is for project staffing where we only have two fuzzy sets, which is D1 and D2. Again, there's a amount of overlap. Now, question is also uh, up to you as a, as a developer, as a designer, as an engineer, for you to play with this uh, overlap. Zero overlap, 10% overlap, 20% overlap. Of course, the maximum will be uh, from the experience of the uh, work in this area, not more than 50%. And even 50% is too high. So it should be, what you can see here, quite a small amount. But we also seen some cases whereby there is zero uh, overlap. 0% overlap. Now, again, for the same uh, uh, example as before, if there any value y1 within that units of this cost y, right? Uh, what is the membership for b1? What is the membership for b2? So, we basically look at where does it overlap or intersect, intersect b1, intersect b2. So, for the first case of b1, intersects at y1. So, the membership for B1 class or B1 set is only 0.1, whereas the membership for the set B2 or membership B2 is 0.7, so it's higher. There's a question from Yao Sing. Let me check now. Uh, uh, when do we need, I think he's asking, when do we need OLED? When do we, when we don't need OLED? Good question. What do you want to the class thing? Uh, there is no magic formula. There's nothing to say that uh, uh, we always use 10% or, I mean, the question is, do we actually even need overlap? Okay, then, uh, uh, wait, 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 uh, Ying, Jing Yong, uh, before I answer you, uh, let me answer, try to answer Yao Xing's question. Uh. It's a very good question. Unfortunately, there is no uh, one answer in the sense that uh, this is one of the parameters. This is one of the system parameters that you can play with, right? So it's up to you to decide um, whether uh, would your answer, would your, would your back to here, right? Um, you see, uh, 
here what they're trying to do here is they're trying to evaluate this uh, failure or success of your project. Right? So again, uh, you, you try with different variables. Uh, you vary this from no overlap to some overlap. Right? You play with that, you tune it, basically, it's basically tuning. Right? And of course, you can also rely on the uh, prior work. What people, what the researchers have done in this field. And finally, uh, after reading 10 papers, you find that, hey, actually, at the end of the day, they say that uh, 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 maximum of 10 overlap will do. And so that's, that's this part. You have to play with that and, and tune it and see what one works for you, what works for your problem that you have. Right? It can also maybe work uh, with, without any OLED, right? Of course, with no OLED, it's easier for you to design the uh, three dimension. Good question, I was saying. Let's look at the next question, which is from Jing Yong. Does the OLED or no OLED have to deal with all and uh, and rules? Um, okay, welcome, I was saying. Back to this uh, Jing Yong's question, let me repeat that. Uh, does the overlap or no overlap have to do with all, have to do with, uh, I think what he means is that, uh, does it only work with all and N? Yes. Um, I think why, because I, again, uh, you can say why, why don't I work with not, why don't I work with, uh, what else, X all? Why don't I work with uh, X all and the X no, right? So my answer is I, I must see anybody doing that. What does it mean? It means that uh, those exotic uh, Boolean function, your XOR, your XNOR, and your NOT and your NOR, on the NAND and your NOR, uh, I'm not seeing that. Because why? Uh, it works pretty well with either the OR or the NOS. Because again, again, this is something that uh, humans can easily understand. If your back to here, right? If your project funding is adequate, right? And again, where do we get this? Uh, uh, where do we get this uh, rules from? By right? talking to the expert. So when you talk to the expert, he or she will not tell you in very exotic terms. It's only uh, look at your project funding. If the project budget is sufficient, or you have enough people. No, your project have a very low risk and jalan, no problem, it will not fail. So those are things you after talking to people. But imagine talking to a person, to an expert, who will now tell you in terms of exotic uh, Boolean function. Uh, if the project is adequate, then there's this thing about exclusive norm. <laughs> your project staffing is sufficient, is small, then the risk is uh, norm is low. So maybe we don't for, for, for most people, experts, huh, we don't talk in terms of those exotic uh, terms. Right? So again, the overlap and overlap, and overlap I think uh, I've answered uh, early on. Uh, Yao Xing, hopefully that's answered your question. Because why? Um, the overlap is a separate issue. The O and N is a, a separate issue, which you'll see later on. Right? So I click back to here. Now, if there's no overlap here, so the membership for each of these fellows here will be very clear. Right, so again, uh, maybe if I move it to here, then I can draw, 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 explain to you. If let's say, if I look overlaps, uh, I have one here, but I have another one here. Right, put here. Now, look overlap, I, if, I, if I want to check uh, X1. So you see that, uh, if the call is A1, you see that the membership for A1 for X1 will be just this number here. It doesn't, it, there's no uh, membership for the other, the, other, uh, uh, the other set. But then again, I've seen some experts in this area working in these fields recommending. One of the key strengths of your fuzzy logic is that of this overlap. It can belong to more than one set, as shown here. So why do you make use of that? Right? So again, the the all function and the end function is a separate issue from your overlaps. So I'm just trying to answer. Uh, I think uh, Yao Xing's earlier question about overlapping. How much is enough? Do I use or not? Do I, I don't I use for my application? So again, up to you to tune it, right? Uh, to so that it works well. So we get a better accuracy, which you will. 
appreciate, understand when you look at your uh, assignment. So hopefully I've answered uh, Jim Yong's question. Any, any, anything else from anybody else? Now, the second one is after, after forming the, uh, after specifying your inputs, what do I do next? I will then find the, I will then, uh, I will then uh, evaluate my rules now. Assuming now I built my system, I come up with a very nice set of uh, uh, fuzzy sets of fuzzy memberships. I've also created the correct rules, right? So now uh, I will now test it on the on some inputs. So now I will then. Uh, Take the first, I will then evaluate what's the output. So how do I do that? So this second step is to take the falsified inputs uh, of uh, here, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.7. But again, uh, before I forget that, uh, I mean, even in the early case, I just want to highlight this, uh, this case here, if I have not one that, Right, okay, see here, there is no overlap. Agree? Yes. So if I take one value here, what is my membership for A1? What's my membership for A2? What's my membership for A3? Even though there is no overlap, the membership for A for uh, this is X1, eh? X1 for A1 is let's say this is a uh, this is a point A point eight over here is one, eh? let's say point eight. So A1 will be point eight. Now, what about A2 and A3? I have highlighted this in one of the earlier lectures that. Uh, the actual uh, membership for A2, or rather the set, uh, the graph for A2 and A3 actually looks like this. So actually it extends into zero. So anything here actually is extended. So there is a value here. The value is actually A2 is zero point two. So it does, it, it sort of, if I may say so, if, if I were to equate, if I were to equate zero, uh, zero membership to uh, no membership, so this one has no membership, does not belong to A2 in zero. The same applies to A3, which is also 0 0.0. So again, remember, we talked about, we showed this before in one of the, I think one of the, the polar, right? We have this uh, representation. You can have it as 0 0.8 over 1, so 0 0.0 over 2, and then last one, same thing, 0 0.0 over 3. Meaning that I have 0 0.8, if um, you have membership for class A1, 0, 0.0 membership for class A2, and finally 0, 0.0 for class A3. So even though in this case, as I said before, even though they can see that there's no overlap, but actually there's a overlap of being 0. Right, so that belongs to two classes, right? Normally, we only look at those that are not zero to highlight that rather than zero. Actually, we normally keep quiet. We don't want to talk about that. But you can see it's actually still there. So we take the values here, which is here, membership uh, for 0.5, which is uh, for x and then for y. So we have 0.5, 0.2, 0.1, 0.7. So 0.5 for the uh, input x, and then uh, which is uh, intersecting at a1 at 0.5 membership. Membership for a2 being 0.2. Membership for y, y1 at for b1 being 0.1, and finally the membership for y at b2 being 0.7. Okay, now as a question here, I think you guys better let me because I don't quit all. Uh, 
So even the zero we call this. Uh, look, zero is not overlap, but you still you get a membership because the, my 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 argument is that the overlap will give you more than one value. All right. So we have this overlap. Clearly, you can see that it actually intersects at point two at five. It's overlap, but it's not overlap. You 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 still have to. There's still a there's still a membership. Membership is zero. Right, so zero when you when you actually calculate into your system, uh, zero actually uh, is not one lap, quote unquote. Whereas in this case, you can see there's a value here. Uh, maybe hopefully in the next few slides it will become clearer. So I think basically you just remember among all lap is actually another question, um, another big uh, area of work to say that uh, I think I've seen some papers saying that uh, you know if you put one lap. The amount of uh, improvement is actually not much. I correct, uh, Jing Yong. So you, because later on you see that because membership is the one that you have to use it to calculate. Uh, later on you see that uh, because uh, if you have not one lap, this will be zero, um, correct? And this will be some value here. Uh, same applies here. Okay. So we the membership value, the bigger membership is very very important. That's why we use it in our calculation, as we see later. On. The rest of you can follow. I'm going a bit slowly because, uh, you know, just in case some of you find difficult to follow. Okay, the way am I? Okay, so we have these two inputs, which is uh, 0.5, 0.2, 0.1, and 0.7. Uh, point, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.2 is only meant for the uh, x. What do you call it? The x input, whereas the other one is actually on the y inputs, which is 0 0.1 and 0 0.7. Now, once you have these values for the inputs, what, what happens next? You apply them to the antecedents. Can you remember what is antecedent? That is the if part. The if part of your, uh, uh, this the if part, uh, if x is a3 or y is you are to be applied to these parts here. So, um, you apply them to the antecedents of the fuzzy group if they are three in their previous slide. Now, in addition, if a given fuzzy group has multiple antecedents, more than one, which is actually rule one, rule two, except for rule three, rule three only one, very simple. So your rule one, rule two, you can have more than one antecedents, which is or, uh, x or y, x and y. Right, the then you apply your fuzzy operator now, which is your end of the whole. So you can see here, we don't talk about those uh, exotic, I call it exotic uh, uh, fuzzy operators. So norm normally we come, we look at the when you read other people's work. We just talk about end and all. We don't talk about anything uh, more than that. But of course, there's nothing to say you can't do that because, as I said before, if you if you find that you can actually use some of these exotic. Uh, Operators and give you better results. You just explain why you do it and then you show them the results. Right? It's always in the results. So you apply those fuzzy operators, the end or the all, to obtain a single number. Using those operators for you to get a single number for the antecedent part. Right? Because when you have two numbers, when you have two uh, values here, like uh, this case, uh, uh, the uh, not this case, actually this case, x and y. So we are actually looking at both the inputs, x and the y. So how do you combine that? How do you aggregate that? Right. So we aggregate to the operate base, and then to from using the fuzzy operators, we obtain the single number which represents the result of the antecedent evaluation. You need to combine them to get one value. Now, this number which is actually the truth value. I will still call it the degree of truth. Huh? Is then applied to the consequent membership function. Now, this value then is applied to the consequent part of your uh, the, the the rule itself. So, when you combine these two uh, parts here to get one value, the value that's applied to your antecedent part. 
for Z to C1, Z to C2, Z to C3, as you will see later on in the next few slides. So, how do you then evaluate the conjunction or the disjunction? Right? Disjunction is basically your, uh, for those of you who find it difficult to, um, to remember, think of it as a all, uh, the all function, the all fuzzy operator. Then the conjunction is your n fuzzy operator. How, does it, how do they work? So if you have the all fuzzy op operator, right, we use, uh, we, for you to look at the disjunction of the rule and this means that it's the all function uh, of the of the rules. So in, in this case, uh, I say that if uh, x is y1 or y, uh, x is uh, a1 or y is uh, b1, so we use the disjunction. Right? So typically, the ex such experts, fuzzy expert system make use of a classical fuzzy operation. To, so go back to what we studied uh, last week. This is your classical fuzzy operator. Union, union operator. Now how does the fuzzy union operator work? You can still remember, it works by taking the maximum of the manual sheet for each of them. In our case, we have two uh, inputs, which is the X and the Y. Right? We take the we compare the maximum between the A, uh, sorry, the X and the Y. And then there's the union. <coughs> now, similarly, in order to evaluate the conjunction, right? Now we're not talking about disjunction, we're talking about conjunction. To relate the conjunction of the rule and distance on the, the each part, sir, we then apply the same thing. We apply the, uh, for such a purpose, we apply the fuzzy part of the n function, the n fuzzy operator. Which is basically an intersection between uh, A and B or X and Y. So when you have intersection, we only we then look at the smaller of the two, which is shown here. So mathematically, for intersection, we show it as, as shown below. This is your uh, symbol for your intersection, which is your conjunction uh, rule. And then the, you take the smaller of the two. So when you have a square brackets, what it means is that you take the smaller of the two, you compare the two values, and then take it smaller. If a uh, new A is smaller than new B, you take new A. Otherwise, you take new uh, new B. So now we are now going to look at the. Now we try to we will, we will see how the Mandani style uh, rule evaluation works. <laughs> So this is uh, just how the three rows are shown here uh, visually, graphically, in this uh, picture here, in this graph here. So let's look at the first rule. The first rule is, is, is uh, repeated here. If x, x is a t, right, or y is uh, b1, then c is c1. If x is a3, y is b1 and c is uh, z is c1. a3, b1, c1. a3, b1, c1. Now, this uh, part here is your antecedent and they are um, connected or related with your disjoint function, which is your union, fuzzy right? union. Okay. So um, in this case, uh, you are given a, uh, ah, okay, explain now. Huh? Now, this is your units of discourse x. This is your units of discourse y for x and y, the first part and second part. Now, if you have a value, you can give the value. Huh? Uh, for those of you who have actually completed your, <coughs> your lab in three, huh? think of this as your uh, tipping system which is your quality of the service of the waiter, waitress, like the whole experience, and also the, the food itself. Is the food tasty? Is the food uh, not so tasty? Right? So this is one part. So now you have to, you have, there's a value given to you. Now I want to evaluate based on this system, based on this uh, system to, to evaluate my uh, uh, success or failure of my project. Right? I will now put in a value. So if you say that uh, X is your uh, budget, so I say I have 100,000, which is X1 over here. 
where does my actual value intersect my budget part of my input? So it's here, X1. Now, so you can see here X1. Now, where, going back to the uh, Jing Yong's uh, question just now. So where does it intersect? <coughs> so you can see here with my graph in here, right? You can see here, actually I have separated because it's a, uh, uh, I'm looking at the one by one, easy to see, right? I, I actually it's all combined together. So you can see here, now in this case, uh, yeah, there's no overlap. But so you can see there's no overlap because, mm, well, actually it's a, no overlap because it's, oh, there's a, okay, sorry, sorry. There's an overlap between A, A1 and A2. So you can see here, I, I'll explain later on. Huh? So you have over here, X1. Now, for the first row, is the number sheet for A3. It is zero. So you actually uh, sort of uh, record down the number sheet for A3. Right? You know, uh, what, what's the most of the number sheet if uh, X is X1 uh, for A3? So it's 0 0.0, you can see here. So it's zero. Now, what about the other case when your Y is now Y1, which is your, uh, how big is your team? How many engineers do you have? For this project, let's say I'm going to say that this is somewhere in the middle. Let's say it's 50. I have 50 engineers for my project, right? 50 engineers, and is it a small team or a large team? There's only two uh, sets, which is B1 or B2, right? So over here, since um, since we are only looking at B1, that's why we only show B1 here. Now, in this case, you can see here, I'm looking at B2, so I only draw out to or need to easy to refer to, right? Otherwise, it will be quite really confusing. So in this case, where does uh, B, uh, X, Y, what intersect B1? Intersects at point one. So this is a value record down over here. <coughs> now, so you have zero, A3 membership, and B, point one membership to B1. And this is uh, related or connected, uh, related to, with the, uh, Destroying function or the union function, all function. All function display is your max. Take the maximum of the two. So you compare the two memberships. You compare the two memberships. This is 0 0.0 and 0 0.1. That's why I said it's always the membership you have to consider, right? But the membership is actually is uh, derived from the membership uh, from the fuzzy sets. Membership function that you that, actually, that you have actually used identified over here. So we have B1 and A3. So 0 0.0 compared to 0 0.1, which is the larger membership because they're using all functions here, union, remember? <clears throat> so as a result, you can clearly see it's actually 0 0.1. So this value is now put into 0 0.1 and this value will intersect for C1. From these two values here, I will derive the larger membership, which is 0 0.1. Using that membership point one, I will then use it to define my C1. <coughs> why not C2? Why not C3? Because my rule one only looks at C1. That's why. My, since my rule one only looks at C1, I only care about C1 in this first rule. Now, continuing. Right, we have, uh, we have three rules, so we need to consider the rules one by one. So you can you can you can uh, suspect you know it, right? Suspect that this system can be quite uh, slow if you have thousand rules, right? We we'll talk about that later on in the in the towards the end of, of this uh, lecture. So here in the second rule, we still look at x one and still look at y one. Nothing has changed, but see where it intersects a. Now, because the second rule talks about A2, the second rule talks about B3. Where does it intersect A2 for X and where does it intersect uh, Y uh, B2 for Y input? So we can see here in this case we intersect at point 2 and over and at point 7. But because we're using the end uh, intersection, the, the, the con conjunction function, so we use this is the N function. N function, if you remember, is actually the minimum of the Two values here, which is 
smaller the two, which is 0.2. So after that, with the 0.2, you then see uh, 0.2, where does, it, where does it intersect? Uh, intersect at C2. So we just intersect at C2 to so basically uh, draw this area under the graph for C2. This is the area that was uh, reflected in the first two parts of your antecedent. Whereas this one actually looks at your um, C1. And this value is actually reflected, um, derived, or uh, calculated from the, uh, the antecedents of your earlier part, which is uh, uh, A3 and B1. So actually, it's, it's uh, what you call it, uh, it uh, simplifies it, right? And say this part one, you get it here. And finally, for real, uh, rule number three, if x is a1, again, you look at x1, where does it intersect a1? Intersects a1 because the rule looks at a1, therefore my x1, I want to see where does x1 intersect a1. Intersects a1 at 0.5. So this value, you bring it over to what? Do I bring it over to c1, c2, or c3? It's at c3 because my rule says that it only affects c3. So you actually uh, shape the area under the, under the, under the graph for that C3 graph. There are three different um, areas that you can see that all this, con uh, all this is computed, calculated from the earlier part of your rules. <laughs> so the, now the result of your antecedent evaluation can be applied to the membership function of the consequent, which is uh, this part here. But there are three different areas. How do I aggregate? How do I combine them? We look at this in the next uh, form here. So now, the most common method, right? again, notice the word used here, most common. The most common method of correlating, right? Co um, combining or relating the rules, uh, the rule consequent with the proof value of the rule antecedent is to cut the consequent membership function at the level of the antecedent proof. That's what we did here. We cut it at that level based on the Result of your antecedent. Cut the consequent membership. Right, this is a consequent membership. You cut it there based on the uh, level of the antecedent, we call it truth, your so fuzzy membership from the uh, antecedent part. This method is known as clipping. You clip that uh, consequent membership at that uh, level of your antecedent truth. See the top of the membership function is cut away or sliced. The clip fuzzy set loses some information. That is the downside of that. Right? Because you clip the thing, so you're losing some information. That's why you look at it. It's always in engineering. You can't get you can't have everything. You will lose something. Uh, what what we call it? We call it the popular thing. Is that this popular thing is that there is no free lunch. You you do this, you you have to pay for this, right? You want to have a big piece of uh, uh what uh, fried chicken, you have to pay more. You want to have a, a better piece of chicken, you have to pay more, right? Versus the other one, which is uh, you don't like the drumstick, you get something else, now. Huh? Less popular, so you're going to pay so much better. Of course, the enjoyment is not the same. So in this case, you, have to, you lose information. But clipping is still often preferred. Why? Because it involves less complex and faster mathematics and generates an aggregate output surface that is easier to diversify. Two things here. By using clipping, it's easy to calculate less complex. And as a result, you get faster results. And then uh, third thing is that it, it actually generates an output surface that's easier also to be falsified for you to again calculate the output value. Right? Imagine if uh, I think uh, you may have seen before that uh, you know I, I can use a, such a system to control the, the boiler and the, what's up, uh, the the steam engine and the boiler. Right? In our case. For example, a nuclear a nuclear uh, plant and a boiler, right? So uh, obviously, if the nuclear reactor is exhibiting some 
abnormal conditions. I want to know it quickly. I do not want to. I do not want to know it after ten hours. By the way, I think uh, uh, since last week, I've been trying to look around. I actually uh, created a new search, not a new, uh, a new in the sense that uh, we have not used it. Uh, a new uh, search technique, which is called root force. Root force. That means that I will consider all the possible paths to solve my traveling sales person problem. As I said, as I've uh, told you in class in the lectures, uh, if you want to do that, that's the best way for me to generate to give you the shortest answer, uh, but not so, shortest uh, travel, shortest shortest path, the path from go to here to Ipo to whatever. Uh, whatever come back to KL is the fastest. I can guarantee you that. But, right, it will take you many hours to count it. So, uh, my program has been running since uh, a few days ago. It's still not completed yet. It's only based on 16 cities, which is your, uh, your, 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 your data set in your lab number two. It's still running after a few days. On, on my on my PC right, over here. Still not complete. It's only 16 cities, right? 16 is still considered a toy problem. You said it's a small problem. You can't find that simple problem in the real world, right? When people want you to solve a problem. So it's still running. So this is what I'm saying. So if you want to use a guarantee you guarantee me the best answer, right? Guarantee. It will take you a longer time. But if you don't want to guarantee me and get an answer which is almost equally as good, close to the best, I can do it, but it's much faster, but of course I can't, I won't, won't be the best. It will be close to the best, but it's still very fast, right? So back to my example of the nuclear plant. If I want to use that to monitor my nuclear plant, I do not want to get the answer one hour later, it's too late, right? If there's something happening, a moment happening, I want to know it as soon as possible, right? So it's what I mean. So clipping is still preferred because it, involves less complex and faster mathematics, basically faster computation, calculation. And then from there, you can actually, as a result, can generate and aggregate a combined output surface that's easier for the system to be classified. Now, while clipping is frequently used, so as I said before, clipping is commonly used, frequently used, but the other method that people are using also uh, is also popular, which is scaling. Now, scaling is better uh, because it preserves the original shape of the fuzzy sets. It scales it down. Now, what does scaling mean? Uh, we'll see later on in the next few slides to show the compare between clipping and what does the scaling do. Now, the original membership function of the root consequence adjusted in scaling. Uh, in scaling the original membership of the rule consequent. We're also talking about the rule consequent, which is this part. So do I use clipping as shown here or do I use scaling? How does it work in scaling? So in scaling, the original membership function of the rule consequent right, on the as shown just now is adjusted by multiplying all its membership degrees by the truth value of the rule antecedent. So in this case, if I the output on my rule antecedent point one. I will then multiply all its membership values by the truth value of the, of the, uh, the antecedent rules. This method, which generally loses less information, because scaling, you still lose information, but now it's you lose lesser information. Right? If you lose lesser information, what does it mean for you as an engineer? It means that you can get a better and more accurate system from that. So it can be useful. Uh, in fuzzy access system because it loses less information. So, um, you know, if I, instead of let, instead of going to KL, I, uh, if you use the clipping, I might end up in the uh, neck because the error is very large. But in this case, if you use scaling, if I want to go, go to KL, maybe uh, I'll land in quite close to KL, for example. <clears throat> so this is a uh, visualization of what does how and the uh, scaling and uh, clipping uh, will do. On the left-hand side, as an example, we take up uh, the fuzzy output of C2. 
if you do clipping of point two, you say that I just cut, right? And then I, I, I show this, I get this, and I get this because this is just a scale downward. I thought it's a check the whole thing. But if I use scaling, right, I think what he's trying to say is always that uh, this actually maybe may not be relevant, this, this area here, but actually you still consider that. So this one has more error compared to the scaling. So scaling, you multiply all the membership, every point by 0.2. That's how you scale it down to 0.2. So that is your. Uh, they call it the uh, comparison okay. of clipping and your scale. Okay, now I look at the time. It's about uh, 10 of, uh, 11 o'clock. Do I do want to do want to have a short break or can I continue? Or oh, I think the previous case we have a, maybe just have a short break, and then the rest of you, of course, if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask. Let's take a short five minute short break. See you after this. Okay.
Okay, let's continue. After completing the step two, we now will aggregate all the outputs from the three rules. Right? So what is the process? So aggregation is a process of unification of all the outputs of all the rules. You take the membership functions, all the rule consequence previously clicked or scale, right? You can use clip or, or scale. So in our this paper, we always use uh, clipping, right? Scaling is a bit more tedious. So it's not necessary for the theory part. Also in your calculations, uh, in your calculations, if you are come across as a question, you use clipping. Easier for you. And then you combine them into a single fuzzy set. That's the whole purpose to aggregate by combining all of them. How do you do that? The input of the aggregation process is the list of the clip or scale consequent membership functions. And the output is one fuzzy set for each output variable. Let's look at how we do this in the next few slides. So this is from rule number one over here, this rule number two over here, and any rule number three. You aggregate or you combine all three of them into one consequent uh, function, or com the one fuzzy set, which is your shown here. The rest are been removed. The top here is clicked, right, thrown away. Same here, thrown away and thrown here, thrown away. So now how we combine and get one value. Basically you sum up right, all the three areas here. You do this. This is your process of rule uh, output application. So now once you've done that, here I will have to now be falsify my outputs set into just one nice value. So the last step, step four, in the fuzzy inference process is your the falsification. Now, fuzziness helps us to evaluate the rules. That's the first part, right? You have the rules, you falsify them, you have us evaluate the rules, form the rules, get the outputs. But the, out, but the final output of the fuzzy system has to be a crisp number. It cannot be fuzzy, right? You have the one number, some value. It cannot be uh, fuzzy value, right? So the input for your defalsification process is the aggregate output for the set. And the output is a single number. So it gives you a single number back to the example of your lab. Uh, trying to find out how much tip should I give. It can't be, you know, uh, you can't say the tell 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 the tell the user, uh, just give a generous tip, just give an average tip, or just give a small tip. I want to know the actual number. I want to know how much power should I uh, give to stop my car. Right? If you're looking at the fuzzy braking system, right? So um, things like that. But you need a single number. So this is actually obtained from your the falsification process. There are several the falsification methods. Right? Of course, there are many. Of course, uh, why there are many? Because each, uh, there's no one single one that fits every day. So each we have to decide what the best method to be falsified. But uh, normally we use the what we call the center of gravity uh, or centroid technique. But the most popular one, based on popularity, of course, when it's popular, it must be reason because it works quite well and quite fast, simple to process. This is the centroid technique. The centroid technique finds the point where the vertical line would slice the aggregate set into two equal masses. Find a vertical line 
that will basically uh, slice, cut your aggregate set over here into, on the left-hand side, the whole area is equal to the right-hand side area. So find a line here. Find the line. The trick is to find the line. How do you do that? <coughs> so this is actually your center of gravity or COG. So mathematically, how do you do that? Mathematically, you look at here. The COG is calculated as the uh, differentiate, not in integrate the uh, membership value mu a x multiplied by x dx. Right? So you actually multiply the uh, membership at that point with the actual uh, uh, value of your uh, x divided by the integration of your, basically your summation of your membership in that range. Over here. So you take the, uh, the values uh, of the membership over here, the y axis over the x axis uh, set in this case. So this is basically now, if you look at here, uh, in the simple case of your isosceles triangle, you can also calculate by center gravity. If you remember the equation, uh, actually, I mean, actually, the center point here would be, imagine this is your area, right? If you have a nice area, which is uh, the area actually is a uh, part of isosceles triangle, right? So you actually take the um, maximum value divided by the smallest value, divided by two, and then plus your, uh, this value here, the minimum value. This is your simple case of your isosceles triangle. This is on the uh, units of this cost, and Z, this is our case, and then this is your Membership. The peak beam are always at one, cannot be more than one. <laughs> so now for a more complicated type, right? The uh, of course the best value is actually calculate the area for this trapezoid. And if you look at if you look around, if you if you check back your your, your mathematics books uh, in the previous years, or you can even check online. You find that the area for the uh, uh, for what the center of gravity for your uh, trapezoid over here. Trapezoid that means means that basically you have only two sides which are parallel, the rest are not the other two sides are not parallel. So the center of gravity actually can be uh, can be uh, described in this way: the center of gravity. Uh, you're looking at the the y will be this and the x will be this. You can see it's quite. It's a bit of effort to remember the equations uh, to calculate this. Uh, now, so we calculate the uh, area of the trapezium now. In this case, you can see that both sides are quite hard. We're back to our early example of our isosceles triangle, right? Same thing. Now, I only take cut the, <coughs> uh, the trapezium of the trapezoid area. So, what is the quick output from this area? Right? Remember, in the process of the classification, our objective is to find one single value. This is your quick output, one value. So let's look at the area of the trapezium, which is half the height multiplied by d1 and d2, which is so the quick output will be the area, this area times the centroid divided by the area. So this is actually we put in the values, you get this, <coughs> and the value will be one five nine somewhere over here. It's coming over here. So that is a simple cases whereby the actual uh, final output area of the output is actually can be described by a common mathematical uh, shape, trapezoid or the tra uh, uh, triangle or the, or the trapezium or trapezoid. In the case where it's no, not so simple as shown by, by this graph here, by this picture here. <coughs> Which is quite, quite uh, this is quite complicated. Huh? So yeah, what's the other way of doing this? What's the practical way of doing this? Finding the center of gravity. <coughs> the centroid, the classification method finds a point representing the center of gravity of the fuzzy set A 
on the interval A to B. So this is interval A to B in the earlier example will be 127 by 191. We're going to find this uh, center gravity, whereby the left-hand side area is equal to the right-hand side area. So a reasonable estimate, a reasonable estimate. Notice the word reasonable, <coughs> right? Uh, it's a quite a good, uh, quite close to the actual value, right? Because uh, small, um, small errors can be obtained by calculating it over a sample of points. So a reasonable estimate can be obtained by calculating it over a sample of points. Again, I can also see here that uh, a lot of fuzzy words can be used. Reasonable estimate. What do you mean by reasonable estimate? What do you think? Reasonable estimate means what? Do I accept 5% error? Do I accept 10% error? Do I accept 20% error? What do you think? Right? So this is reasonable. Of course, if you say that uh, you know the error is 90%, of course that would be not a reasonable estimate, right? It should be something quite small. But of course, as I said before, early on in engineering, there's always a price to pay. No free lunch, as you see later on, what I mean by that. So in this case, if I have this uh, back to our example, our three rules example of uh, X and Y, and then the output is uh, Z, what do you do? You have this area now, this was what they uh, decided, calculated before, and then you take the, you sample it over regular intervals of 10 in this example. So let's look at the first one. What is the uh, membership for zero, right? It will be 0 0.1. Remember that we said before, so we have this rule here. You actually map, multiply the actual membership by the actual uh, point, which is so uh, x. Huh? Right. So if, if you take the first value here, 0, multiplied by membership of 0 0.1. The next sample, which is at 10, then multiply at 0 0.1. So I'm just, just by of <coughs> rearranging it in this nice uh, nice order. Right? If you see. What does it mean? It means that for 0 to 20, it's always at the same membership. Right? So I group them, group them over here and 0 0.1. The next three, the next four samples. 30, 40, 50, and 60. The membership is 0 0.2. So that's what I do here. Right? You actually uh, sum up, right? sum up or integrate all the, uh, the product of your membership multiplied by the actual value over here. And finally, the last one, which is only uh, four samples. Uh, again, for 70, 80, 90, 100 <coughs> times 5 over here. Divided by so all the memberships that, that you have sampled. 0 0.1 over here, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and it goes on. Then once you calculate this one, you give answer 67.4 over here. Now for those of you who are interested, right? How do I know my answer is correct? <clears throat> right? What's the heuristic for doing that? As a simple and quick check, look at the The area on the left hand side <coughs> versus the right hand side. Do you think this area? I will put a sort of a my finger here. Would this be balanced? The area here is it equal to this area here? So it looks like to me it looks balanced. So there's a quick check whether the answer is right or wrong, right? And is it reasonable? <coughs> So you can see that. Um, okay, missed here. <clears throat> okay, right. Next question is <clears throat> go back to our earlier command. Huh? Reasonable estimate. <clears throat> okay. So this one gives me an uh, answer 67.4. But 
is that a good answer or is that a, uh, far from the actual answer? <clears throat> right? Um, how do I know? How do I do it? Um, especially if you're writing a program, writing or designing a system. How many samples is enough? There is again no right answer, right? Other than saying that it depends on how fast you want the answer. If I want the answer quickly, I take smaller samples. I take a smaller sampling rate. But again, if you, uh, I think for those of you who have studied the, uh, I think in uh, digital signal processing, right? Um, there's a sampling error, right? So the more you sample, you get less error you get. Of course, it's a price to pay. You have to take more time to, to calculate. So again, no one answer. You decide. <clears throat> the same goes for the exam. Right, so uh, in, in, in such cases, uh, so we always, uh, in the old days, uh, we give you a graph paper to actually, for example, to transfer this graph into a graph paper, and then from graph paper, you take your samples to actually get a better uh, estimate. Because you see, if I pick uh, some, uh, sampling rate of 10, uh, my sampling rate is 10, what do I see? I see that this point I miss out. So therefore, this will then create errors a bit, right? Because Somewhere 27, 28, you find that actually it's not uh, 0.2, neither is it 0.1, it's in between. The same also applies here. So there's an error there due to uh, estimation, the est estimation problem, right? So um, in the past, uh, for one year, this uh, COVID 19, I find that the students actually, in 80% of the time, they do not, uh, when this question comes up, when they do, they do not want to transfer this graph into a graph paper. Rather, they do it onto the actual, uh, what they call it, the, uh, the actual question paper, which is the PDF file. They actually okay, estimate, right? So, of course, they have to add some errors, right? <clears throat> so, it'd be interesting to find out if you increase the sampling rate, right? So, the assumption is what? If you increase the sampling rate, I will approach the, I will approach the more accurate answer. So, this answer, actually, you find that actually, uh, is quite quite different from the uh, actual answer when you increase your sampling rate. <clears throat> I can then increase it to what? 0 0.1, 0 0.001, my sampling rate. Huh? Instead of having 10, huh? I pick sampling rate of 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. Huh? That's easy to do, especially if you do it on an Excel or a computer, for example. <clears throat> So this is the what we call the center of gravity uh, method of the classification, centroid, based on the center of gravity. Now, what other methods are there? This is basically for your information, uh, for you to at least uh, appreciate that it's not, not only one method. There are many methods, huh? but of course, uh, you need not use them, if it, if it, if it, especially in the exam or, or, or even in your calculations. Huh? You need not use them, but at least you know that there are also other methods. One is called center of sum, weighted average, first of maxima, last of maxima, and mean of maxima. So I'll quickly go through what uh, this one actually involves. So center of sum actually is the, uh, in this method, the overlapping area is counted twice. And then that's how we actually arrive at this one is the actual center of sum of uh, these two A1, A2 when it's combined. So it's just actually, I'll show you how we actually rewrite the answer right, in this case. Right? So you have sum is 5.35 over somewhere over closer to here. I see it's a nice line. Huh? Separate two parts left and right. Now the R. So this is actually you can see it's quite quite uh, quite uh, complex uh, to actually calculate now. And what is this? Okay, where does this A1 comes in? A1 actually comes in to A1 is actually half of 8 minus 1 plus 7 minus 3. What is coming? So basically, well, this one actually shows you. How I arrive at the answer. So this is actually half of this three minus one is area, the first part, and another part is three. Um, we have uh, half of this seven minus three plus three minus seven for this other part, then times one five, right? Here by here by two, so we get this answer. The next one is weighted average. Now this method is valid for fuzzy sets with symmetrical <laughs> symmetrical output membership functions. Only symmetrical. They are all symmetrical. Over here and produces results very close to the uh, COA method. This is the center of uh, one. I think center of uh, I think maybe it's in the center of gravity method. Right? 
this method is actually uh, the advantage is that uh, although uh, it gives you good accuracy, at the same time, it's also less computationally intensive. It doesn't need that much comp computing calculation, but it gives you high accuracy. Each membership function is weighted by, weighted by its maximum membership value, right? the maximum value. And then the, the, the diversified, again, same thing, is also uh, divided by the uh, membership itself. Let's look at this. Huh? So this one will be uh, weighted by its membership value. So 60 is the highest value, right? And, no, 0. 0.6 multiplied by uh, 60, right? Maximum membership value. So we take 0. 0.6 multiplied by 60 plus 70.4. Largest value for this is 80.2, and then finally uh, 90. Okay, two again, and then of course zero is zero, right? And this gives you supposedly give you quite high accuracy. Right, compared to the other methods. So maybe that's why but this, this only works with uh, symmetrical output membership. <clears throat> First, the maxima, I don't quite like this because it's, um, it's actually, it's, uh, I think it's a very rough estimate, rough estimate. Uh, you, here in this method, you determine the smallest value of the domain with the maximum membership value. Smallest value of the domain with the Maximum membership value. So this will be this is your middle of course x and then uh, at this value here you take uh, this okay. smallest value is okay. and then of course it will take the last oh uh, yeah the smallest value okay I, I know what it means actually you look at it here uh. now what is the largest uh, what is the uh, the area with the largest membership value this part here this rectangle. This part here gives you the largest membership value. So this is your maximum membership value. Now notice that at this point here, there are two, two points with the largest membership value. Either four or either six, either, sorry, eight. So what it's telling you is that you take the first of the maximum, this one, the smallest of the two, or smaller of the two, right? So it's four. So quickly you can find answer is four. So that is the advantage of this very fast, but of course I suspect this one gives you a, quite a large uh, uh, error. Of course the flip side is uh, you pick the last, last of the maximum, same thing as the game, right? Instead of two values here, of the largest membership, you pick the, small, the largest one, which is 8 over here. So if you use this method, you use 8, the early method, you get a 4. So of course, huh, someone will, some smart fellow will say, okay, what do I take in between? Right? Rather than taking the maximum or taking the minimum, I take uh, in between, median. So again, same concept. So in this case, you get a six. Yeah. Example now. So in this case, let's have uh, this example whereby we have two outputs here. And then we have this graph. So, this up. so this, this is the membership for your output. Okay, for maybe uh, z equals to what, what, z1 and then the z2. So um, the, remember, uh, the, 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 the antecedent of the rules intersect these two graphs uh, and give you a graph that looks like, like this. So how do you get by clipping? Right? I, I'm saying and when you clip, you get this answer 719.8194 7, based on this shape right, by clipping, right? In our example. Now we do it by scaling. Right, you scale the two graphs. You scale it, right, uh, depending on what is your membership value. So this is, uh, what is it, a point, so point two, I think, point two, point two and point four, I believe. This point five and point two five, right? Point five and point two five, right? So if you scale it, you get this, and then the answer is 699. So you can see here. Um, remember, we said before, Clipping introduces a larger error compared to scaling. Scaling has a smaller error. So I, if, if that is true, so this will give you the more accurate answer, which is closer to uh, 700. The first one is 719. You see there's an error about 20. Huh? The, the difference. So, but then, is this uh, error acceptable for your application? Right? 
So imagine if I want to land my plane in Kuala Lumpur, right? My fish calculation it then sends me to Singapore, right? So is that acceptable? So that one again, there's no answer. You have to answer that in the application. And then of course, if you if you, if you uh, uh, want to improve your accuracy, what can you do? I can increase my sampling rate. I, I can also change it to uh, maybe instead of clipping, I use other forms, huh? scaling, and then use the uh, last of minima, the mean of minima, and so on and so forth to actually copy my answer. Okay, so again, for comparison, it's a slight error. But again, the slight error is that acceptable? Right? So again, because there's a trade off, right? the word is trade off. So you have a less accurate answer, but it's much faster than scaling. So answer, um, this is only about three percent. So can you accept three percent error? So again, this is something for all of us uh, when, when we are practicing engineers. We have to uh, in your wisdom, in your experience, in your training, especially I think more towards wisdom, years of experience. Uh, what method should I use? So you have to decide. Right? Based on this, I think 3% is acceptable. Of course, I can bring it further down by increasing my sampling rate in the clipping. But then look at it closely. If I increase my sampling rate by having more samples, what does it mean? I'll be coming close to my scaling, which also requires a lot more computation time. So again, again you are constrained by that. So as engineers, you are constrained by that. Therefore, in uh, some, uh, some, some communities, some communities, they suggest that this is something that can solve I mean, using the map. The tricks method, the cheese method, which some of you have actually been uh, uh, training uh, using the tricks method to actually find the best answer uh, to solve the problem. Now, that is your mandani. So, let's look at Sugeno now. So, the uh, mandani style inference, as we've just seen, requires us to find a centroid of two dimensional shapes by integrating across a continuously varying function. Now, in general, this process is not computationally efficient. It takes time, not very fast. Then come along Michio Sugeno. So Michio Sugeno suggested to use a single spike, uh, also known as a singleton. A spike, spike as the membership function of the Wu constituent. Two things here I want to draw your attention. It's a single spike. Now, what's a single spike or a single turn? Right? It's basically a, it's a line. And uh, it will become clearer in the next few slides. We'll show you what is a single spike or a single turn. But more importantly, this uh, Sugeno's method only, this uh, you change the, 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 uh, the membership function with a single spike now. Right? Only for the rule consequent. You only apply at the rule consequent. You do not apply it at the antecedent. So a singleton, or more precisely, a fuzzy singleton. It's a fuzzy set with a membership. There's unity at a single particular point on the use of this course and zero everywhere else. It's a fuzzy set with a membership function that is one at one point, only one point. And everywhere else for that place is actually zero. There's no overlap in this sort. Ah, this is a uh, Michel Sugeno, uh, I think uh, it will show, show, share with you. So the, in a way, the Sugeno type of fuzzy inference is very similar to the Manani method. So what, what did he do? Let's see what he did was that he actually um, addressed this issue. Uh, I think some of you may actually 
is asked to do this in your FYP. What is the problem you are trying to address? So in this case, uh, this is obviously your FIP will be your uh, project scope. So in this, in this, uh, in, the, in the case of Professor Mandani's uh, Dr. Sugeno's uh, method, it's actually it's addressing the issue of Mandani style inference, which is not uh, computationally efficient. It's slow, right? So he's slow. Don't looking at uh, do that. So instead, he changed the only to change the root constant, right? So, uh, so instead of a fuzzy set, now he used a, uh, a stack or a singleton. He used a mathematical function of input variable. Now, the format of the Sogeno type, uh, Sogeno style, fuzzy rule, as you can see here in this example here, this is the consequent, uh, the, 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 the n function type, uh, where you have more than one n system, related by the n function here. The only part is changed actually here using the singleton. <laughs> so, uh, what's it? Where f or x, uh, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, it's the function of x and y. So, x, y, z are your linguistic variables. So, in this case, your what, what is it? Your project, uh, budget, your project, uh, team, people, right? So, these are the linguistic variables. A and B here are your was it set on the units of this course, x and y, big x and big y, respectively. And f of y here, f of x and y is a method of functions. It still represents your, um, your singleton, which is proposed by Micho uh, Sugeno. So the most common type, most, most commonly used, zero order Sugeno fuzzy model. Right? Again, I, I think there are many other types of uh, probably improvements on the basic Sugeno fuzzy model. So the basic uh, model is called your zero order. Of course, there will be other models, huh? but I think those will be outside the scope of this uh, topic, huh? of this uh, lecture. The most commonly used Sugeno fuzzy model applies the fuzzy rules in the following form. So here, first two parts, the antecedent part is the same. The antecedent, antecedent parts are same, same, right? And then there are more than one antecedent here. If X is A and Y is B, then Z is K. Now K is now a constant. It's not the same, it's not a fuzzy set anymore. It's a constant. <clears throat> right? So it's the sign of a value of one, membership of one. So in a way you can argue this is a crypt value here. So in this case, the output of each fuzzy rule is a constant. Right, and then the, as a result of this, right. So all the consequent membership functions are represented by singleton specs. So you can see here, we look at the same example we've been looking at for the past uh, one hour or so. So here, nothing has changed. You look at the if you based on the inputs, actual input of x1 and y1. What should be my output <coughs> that is transferred over to my consequent part? So here, if it's uh, all function, I pick the maximum value is 1, 1. So now apply at uh, 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 1, 0.1 to the respective rule, which is k1. Now here, K1 represented as a singleton or a spike, just a line. So it intersects at 0.1. Mark it down here, 0.1 for K1. You, you repeat the same process for the other two rules. This is in the case of 0.2 and 0.7, you pick the, because it's an end function, you pick the smaller of the two or the minimum value of the two. <laughs> This value of point, this value of point two, that applied to your uh, consequent for the rule number two, which is applied to K two. So point two will then intersect at K two at point two. Finally, the last one, which is just a single antecedent, which is point five, applied to K three point five. Now I have three, you can see here three points which are marked by my intersections of point one, point two, and point five. Now, how do I 
Ich glaube, eben auch for my Chris Valley. This is how you do, so you can see here, this is for my all three, you get this. So I try to combine. So this is the Sugeno uh, style of application of the rule of this. So we still use the weighted average for the Sugeno output. So what we do, we just multiply 0.1 by this point here. This is K1, K1, K2, K3. K1, K2, K3 are known values. So in this case, we, we believe that no, so I see K1, K2. So if you assume that K1 is 20, K2 is uh, 50, and K3 is 80. So you multiply the, uh, what the, the membership of 0.1 over here to K1, 0.2 to K2, and finally 0.5 to K3. Uh, to K3 at 80 divided by their respective uh, memberships of 0.1, some of the membership of 0.1, 0.2, and 0.5, we give you 65. Now, what was our, our, our earlier, earlier value when we used Mandani? Let's go and check. Sixty-seven point four. Sixty-five versus sixty-seven point four, but so much simpler in the Sugeno cut. Now, if you were to calculate sixty-five with an error of two point four, is that acceptable for the application with your customer? Sixty-five. 67.4, just 2.4, but you can see here, so much simpler. So in this example, you can see that the why to Sogeno type is a, a very um, acceptable alternative to your Mandani method of diversification. So as a result, when you want to, when you do, when you're doing any work on fuzzy different system or fuzzy expert systems, the so two names you cannot run away will be Pandani and Sugeno. So, so first, depending on your on your on the needs, the project needs, whether you want a fast system or a uh, more accurate uh, system, which is actually uh, the Mandani. So now question come back. Before you ask me, I'll tell you answer. How to make a decision on which method to apply? Do I use Mandani or do I use Sugeno? The Mandani method is widely accepted for capturing expert knowledge. It allows us to describe the expertise in more intuitive, more human-like manner. Right, so if we, um, the Mandani method, it allows us to capture the information which we actually extracted from the expert after talking to the expert in a more intuitive, more human-like manner. Unfortunately, Mandani type of fuzzy inference entails a substantial computational burden. There's a lot more of calculation needed in order for you to get the answer. So uh, uh, if, it, if you say you need more uh, effort to calculate, what does it mean in real terms? For you as a system designer, it will mean that the system will be slower. Uh, right, um, even Apple to Apple, like if you're using on the same platform, there's still a finite right, uh, amount of, uh, of uh, a penalty on using Mandani because you need more time to calculate. Whereas the other guy, you can use Sugeno faster. So on the other hand, the Sugeno method is now is is known to be computationally effective and works well with optimization and adaptive techniques, which makes it very effective in control problems particularly for dynamic non-linear systems. Why do we say control problems? Because control problems need to have an answer in real time. I cannot wait for even one second, two seconds. If one second is too late, even, you know, even seconds. Huh? If I'm talking in terms of uh, uh, micro seconds, right? So I think, uh, one of you actually working with Dr. Ho Kami, if I'm not mistaken, on uh, looking at the end of the day with a control system. 
to look at the uh, to tell your car if you're moving and your car is driving yeah, to look at look out for potholes or even the bumps, the speed bumps on the road. Now, if your car is moving at quite a high speed, uh, when I say high, right, I'm not looking at 100, I'm looking at maybe 60 to 70, right? So you can imagine uh, that kind of speed, what is my reaction time? I need to really slow down if I see a pothole coming up. Right? So again, you can work out the, the, the numbers huh? and see that I need my answer quite quickly. It cannot be a few seconds. But a few seconds, even though traveling at 60 km an hour, right? you, you find that actually, um, it's a, you know, uh, if, you cut, if you take more than seven seconds, huh? the car will reach the pothole before your answer comes up. So again, this I think we need to be considered in designing and also uh, determining whether do I make a do I use a Sukeno, do I use a Mandani method for my diversification. <coughs> so uh, I actually I think uh, I think starting from last year, I actually went out to find something more concrete. Did anybody publish anything? <coughs> This. So in this example here, I think this uh, group of people from the Acropolis Institute of Technology and Research in, in uh, Indore, which is India, they actually did a study on, to compare the Mandani and the Sugano type of fuzzy inference system on the enrollment datasets. We so actually uh, look at this for application of the um, enrollment datasets. Actually, this is a quite interesting area. Uh, maybe next year I'll do that. Huh? It's a simple FIP project to we'll actually do a comparison right, on the Mandani and Sugeno. You know? Maybe then compare it with, uh, say, for example, the, uh, the uh, maybe artificial view network, see which is better huh? on, on some interesting engineering problems. Right? You, can, you can also apply this in your FIP currently to actually uh, look at it. Because I believe that when you do that, huh? You find that, that the people in, like me, interested, lecturers interested to find out are there any work done to concretely say that uh, Sugeno is better than Mandani or Mandani is better than Sugeno. Right? So this one tells you this paper, if you're interested, go and check it out and to tell you which is a better method. So it's actually no for sure with a certain higher level of confidence that uh, you know either Mandani is better or the Sugeno is better. Okay. So I extracted it. So basically, uh, this one actually look at you look at basically 13 linguistic variables. So it's quite a large number of uh, variables. Uh, 13, not 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 just uh, one or two. Uh, and again, on only two inputs. So you can see here, even in such an example, okay, they don't have many many inputs. So maybe it's telling us that uh, if you have too many inputs, uh, nowadays you don't use that anymore because. Uh, there are other better methods which uh, really uh, works better. As, as you see later on, uh, what are the weaknesses of your fuzzy inference system? Ah, this one I actually reproduced from the uh, yeah, paper. And basically, you can see, right? In terms of the error, right? This is the actual value. And you can see Mandani actually lies in, in between. The error is smaller compared to the Hogan method. So of course the Sugino can boast about the method being faster compared to Mandan, but it, it can compensate that by having a faster machine, right? I can, I can I have both things. I can have a Mandani, which is more accurate. I can also give you quite uh, uh, high computing speed in terms of coming up answer quickly. But again, what's the downside? What's the disadvantage of that? I will pay more to get the faster machine, right? So again, I said there's no free lunch. So they concluded that the Mandani type of the uh, first uh, fiction method has a greater accuracy compared to okay, no, I think this is something again we know all, all along. Again, it's only confirms it. Uh, while they may not be accurate, right? Because of okay, no, so the both methods are able to follow the general trend in accurate terms. So you can see here, I also want to share with you here. How can you turn a negative answer into something positive, <coughs> right? So, Sugeno method and the larger error, and both methods here you can see uh, they are not they are not close to the actual answer. But you you claim you can tell the reader that, but you look at the, the general shape 
of your results. They, they are able to follow accurately the up and down of your actual answer. So that is something to be proud of for both the Mandani and the Sokeno. So again, you can use that in your FYP. But how can you uh, convince the reader that your work actually has some value? Is what they are saying. Even though the Mandani and the, and the Sokeno actually are far off, far away from the actual answers. On the other side, uh, 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 but again, these two methods are able to at least follow the trend. They're not just straight line. They're, actual, they're able to accurately model the actual ups and downs, the changes in your actual value. So you can do that in your FIP to show people that the work is actually useful and not uh, you know, inaccurate. So that's what we always say, right? So if your <coughs> FIP actually shows you uh, very bad results, right? And you try your best, but the, the results are not good enough. Still no good, but here, they are far away from the actual answer. What are the positive things you can say about your results? Right? So you have to dig hard, dig deep, and find out if there's something good you can talk about your results. So that makes you, uh, at least you can still pass, huh? or at least you may even get good grades because you're able to analyze. What we mean by analysis, analyze the results and obtain. So, in summary, right? So, this is a good uh, slide for you to remember, for you to actually refer to, right? So, on the left hand side, Mandani is very popular, widely accepted, and is able to capture, allow the capture of knowledge more intuitively or more human like. On the downside, it requires more computation, it's slower. So it's up. On the other hand, Tugendo actually was uh, developed based on this fact. They actually was, uh, they, they look at the, if you look at the problem, you look at Mandani, yes, Mandani can good, get you good results. However, it takes a lot more time to calculate. Can I do something to give you reasonably good results, but faster? That was his objective, that was his project scope, so to speak. So in this case, Tugendo is computationally more effective. It, as a result, since it's able to work fast, it works very well for optimization and adaptive techniques because such adaptive techniques, right, and also when used in dynamic systems, therefore it's popular because it's faster. Because for dynamic non-linear systems, the, the system itself, the, uh, the performance of the system characteristics will change quite fast. It's dynamic, right? So your Sugena must be able to follow. Right, based on those uh, changes, able to give you the right answer quickly and not wait for a few seconds later. Okay, so the next part actually talks about how we actually use the uh, either the Mandani or the Sugeno to actually build a fuzzy expert system on a service center. Right, but looking at the time, I think uh, I will not be able to finish it. So I think I better stop here. And then any questions you have, can ask me. And then the... okay. So we stop here, right? And then the next next day we come come back. We will look at the uh, case study. Okay. So any burning questions you have, or everything is very clear, or like some of you said, takes time to digest. Uh, today, don't know why, but the attendance not so good. Eh? Uh, a lot of you, some of you, some of you actually, many of you, uh, 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 I don't know why. Okay, uh, but uh, I think that in the weeks to come, you find that your workload has increased and the stress is to increase because uh, actually near towards the end of the semester, there are a lot more assignments to submit, and then also your for the FIP uh, oral presentation it can be quite stressful. The FIP presentation because it's a sh uh, short amount of time. I need to convince the, the examiner that they've done some work. Okay, with that, I'll end here. I'll wait for a while again. Please, uh, you can leave now if you want to. Uh, the rest of you, uh, have a nice uh, weekend. And then, uh, take care, take care. The numbers in Malaysia, the COVID, num COVID 19 numbers are increasing. 
Hope you take care uh, and be safe. Okay, thank you.